sickle cell disease. In the previous section, we looked at five levels of prevention as applied in prevention of sickle cell disease. Also, in another section, we looked at what sickle cell disease is all about, the pathophysiology of that disease, and the two uh, most common symptoms, that's jaundice and anemia. We looked at how it does occur and what happens in the client's body or the patient body. In this section, we are going to look at the other signs and symptoms that is being presented by patients suffering from sickle cell disease. Poor growth and development. Poor growth and development. We're going to look at how do sickle cell disease contribute to poor growth and development. You know that sickle cell disease has lots of pathological processes that involves hemolysis of red blood cells. This hemolysis of red blood cells leads to reduction, reduction in hemoglobin levels because as the red blood cell is being destroyed, so, so also the hemoglobin is being destroyed. So sickle cell disease being a hemolytic disease or hemolytic condition can lead to chronic anemia because as the body continues to, the spleen continues to destroy the sickled red cells that have issues, the number of red blood cells will keep on coming down and hemoglobin levels will be decreasing. As such, the body oxygen level, oxygen demand will not be met. Then the body will be trying as much as it can to produce more red blood cells to meet up with the demand of the body. But however, most of the times, the body is overwhelmed and the body can no longer meet up with this. As such, the body will now tilt towards chronic anemia. And chronic anemia results to a reduced delivery of oxygen to tissues. As such, the body will suffer. So the cells that are supposed to help in growth and development will be severely um, suffering from hyposia. As such, growth will be delayed. Also, there is increased nutritional demand. The, the, hematopoietic, the hematopoietic tissues that are found in the bone marrow that is responsible for production of these um, red blood cells require nutrients, require iron, require other nutrients to, to, to be able to produce enough red blood cells that will meet up this demand. So as such, most of the nutrients that the patient, or the patient has, the calories will be sent for this production. I know the bone receive one of the highest blood supply in the body. So it will, send, it will be sent, sent to this um, hematopoietic, hematopoietic tissues to carry out this um, process to meet up with the demand of the body as the body continues to, to destroy the sickle, cell, sickle cells. As such, the nutritional requirements of a person for growth and development will be unmet. As such, that would be um, a growth delay. Another way uh, sickle cell disease can contribute to poor growth and development in a patient is through its chronic inflammation. You know that the patient who, who has sickle cell almost have these chronic infections because at a point when the spleen, you're going to see that in this section, the spleen gets um, a functional aplasia, whereby the, the, the spleen is no longer functioning because of overload of uh, sickle cells in the spleen, because the spleen is responsible for removal, filtration of the blood. At a point, the spleen has been all, um, overpopulated by these sickle cells. As such, the spleen becomes functionally uh, uh, the, the functionally inactive, no longer functional. As such, the immune system will be down because the spleen is part of the immune system of the body. So the person will not be facing a lot of disease conditions from pneumococcus and all of that. And this will, will not lead to chronic inflammations. And these chronic inflammations will lead to secretion of lots of 
inflammatory cytokinins, such as tumor neurosis factor, interleukin-6, and all of that. And you know, during chronic inflammation, the body's metabolic process is increased because of the, the physiological response. The body's energy will be depleted. The, the energy store of the body will be used up. As such, the ones that will be available for growth and development will, will no longer be available. Also, because most times the uh, patient will, who, who is suffering from this sickle cell disease normally go for blood transfusion. A point will reach when there will be iron overload. And this iron overload can impel, impel or So this will not um, actually impair growth and development. Another way sickle cell disease can lead to poor growth and development is through its vaso-occlusive crisis. You know that in sickle cell, because of that sickly nature of those uh, red blood cells that are bad, it leads to blockage of vessels, and that is known as vaso-occlusive crisis, and as such, when this occlusion happens at the smaller arteries that are found around the uh, small, small uh, um, peripheral part of the body, like the hands, the foot, and other smaller, smaller arteries, it would lead to episode of pain. And thus, this frequent pain limits the child or the patient's physical activity, which would lead to reduction in muscle mass and overall development. You know, as one keep on exercising, the muscles are built. But because the person is avoiding this, because of the, the, the patient's always on, in pain, especially during this vasoclosive crisis, the person will avoid physical activity. As such, the muscles are not well developed. As such, affecting growth of muscles and body, body muscles. Another way it can lead to poor growth development is directly acting on the endocrine, on the endocrine gland. Inadequate growth hormone secretions. As, as the child continues to suffer from this, there may be growth hormone deficiencies because of the overall body is already affected. And as such, the, pest, the child may not really grow very well. And the child may also have delayed puberty because of uh, the effects of sickle cell diseases along the hypothalamic pituitary gland gonadal axis and the growth hormones. Because as the body is already in a state trying to only to produce red blood, and most of all these um, um, other part of the body functions are delayed. As such, the child or the client will have um, delayed poverty, puberty. Another signs and symptom is splenic enlargement, also known as splenomegaly. We know that the spleen is found in the in the left the spleen plays a crucial role in filtering blood and removing dysfunctional or damaged blood cells like the red blood cell because it participates in immune response. However, the spleen often becomes enlarged due to hyperplastic expansion and subsequent congestion as it attempts to sequester and remove the increased number of sickle red blood cells. So as the body keep on destroying these abnormal red blood cells, as they begin to the, the higher the number of the sickle cell, the more tasking it is for the spleen to continue to remove them. As such, the, the, skin, the, the spleen uh, cells will increase in number. As such, leads to what is known as hyperplastic expansion in, in order to actually do the work. But however, as time continues, those sickle cells will congest the spleen. As such, making the spleen what? That is why in patients, 
you or a child who has this sickle cell disease, you see the spleen being very big, that is known as splenomegaly. Then these abnormally shaped cells are more prone to hemolysis. We already know. So the red, the red pop of the spleen, which is responsible for filtering blood and cleaning damaged cells, becomes engorged with sickle cells, which leads to the first phase of enlargement of the spleen. Then over time, as the sickle cells continue to accumulate in the spleen, the spleen may undergo what is known as orthosplenotomy. Orthosplenotomy. This means that the spleen is there, but it's no longer there because it's no longer functional. So this process entails that progressive fibrosis and atrophy of the spleen tissues occur, which makes the spleen to be non-functional. It's no longer, it's just, it's just there, but cannot function. As such, the spleen is big and large. As this continues, there will be death of splenic tissues, which will occur because of the consistent and overwhelming burden of the sickled cells, which gradually leads to the loss of splenic functions. So that's another thing, another process that undergoes in the spleen that leads to the spleen becoming more enlarged. Then another cause of spleen enlargement in a sickle cell patient is vasoocclusive crisis, which you all know that because of the splenic trying to take away those um, sickled cells, it leads to a crisis. And at a point, there will be a pooling of sickled blood cells within the spleen, and as such, making the spleen very what, large. The next symptom is painful episodes. Pain is known and sometimes common symptom of sickle cell disease. The classic pain episode seen in sickle cell disease is often called painful crisis, which occurs when the very small blood vessels become blocked by the sickled red blood cells. And this is known as vaso-occlusive crisis. This pain arises due to the obstruction of microvascular circulation resulting from the polymerization of the deoxygenated hemoglobin within the red blood cells, leading to their distortion into the circle shape. We already know about this, that what you need to know about painful episodes that as these circle uh, cells, circle red blood cells, block the smaller, smaller uh, blood vessels, it blocks it and as such, elicite pain. We already know how it's the circling do occur. We have taken that in the other lecture. So, once it blocks it, the, the child or the client has a lot of episodal pains and as such, known as um, vaso-occlusive crisis. So that is a symptom. Now, the another symptom is dactylitis. So back to that episodic pain, that's why sometimes you see the, 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 the patient having pain, known as chest syndrome, pains around the chest because the rib, the rib, um, the rib bone also engages in production of red blood cell. So you see having pains around the, the chest region or the bone, bone pains. Then it's in the part, in the distal part of the body, that is the fingers having lots of pains because of smaller, smaller arteries. Then when they are blocked temporarily, they lead, they, they lead to pain in those patients. Another Another symptom being presented by patients suffering from sickle cell disease is um, dactylitis. If you look at it, you see that light. That is, this you are seeing known as dactylitis inflammation. So the dactylitis is also known as foot hand to foot syndrome. Uh, in children, that may be the first sign you would see before the precipitation of a painful episodal episode that the child would see or have or have. Uh, from the age of eight to 18 months, when the finger or the parts of the hand or, or a toe or other parts of the foot become swollen and highly painful. So that is 
dactylitis is one of the signs and symptoms of um, sickle cell disease. So in a nutshell, we've been able to look at um, how sickle cell presents with poor growth and development. We also have looked at how uh, sickle cell also um, leads to painful episodes and how it also leads to uh, dactylitis uh, and then in other in the previous sections we looked at how it leads to anemia, how it leads to um, jaundice. You've been able to look at those those things, and we have a good understanding of the signs and symptoms of sickle cell disease.